Hi, everyone. Before the episode begins, I just want to remind you to follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Marlene the Plant Lady and YouTube, Everything Gardening with Marlene Simon. And remember, please, please, please rate and review on iTunes and Spotify. That just helps the podcast get a notice by more people and then more people will become better gardeners. And that's what we all want. So enjoy the episode. Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Don't touch that plant! Is it poisonous? She'll become part of the plant. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour. I'm your host, Marlene, and tonight we are going to talk about something I love to talk about, begonias. And people do love their begonias. They're becoming quite the, quote, it plant or Instagrammable plant, but people have been collecting them and growing them for a very long time. So I'm glad um, a lot of people are getting on board with them. So I had the opportunity to meet the Begonia Collections curator of the Fort Worth Botanic Garden a couple of weeks ago. I could have talked to him lo- much longer, but it, we were having a big event at work. But he was nice enough to join me and talk about Begonia. So joining me is Glenn Dickerson. And thank you. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. This is a lot of fun. I can talk about begonias for days. Yes. And, you know, I I, I was picking your brain because I was like, oh, my gosh, there's so much going on today. And you were giving a talk in Sacramento and um, you stopped by. And, you know, it's always a little embarrassing having an expert come by and see a certain specific collection. You know, we're not the conservatory is not known for their begonias. And but I do love them. We try to be species oriented, but my gosh, it's really hard to turn away a beautiful hybrid begonia. But you just went through and all the ones that we didn't have named, you're like, that's this, that's this, this is this, this is this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I <laughs> I need to talk to you longer to get all these names. And then we started talking about growing tips. And I'm like, my gosh, you are a wealth of information. So, you know, I always like to start off hearing about how people got to where they're at. And you're in a pretty sweet spot being the begonia curator of the Fort Worth Botanic Garden. So just tell us a little bit about your background, how you ended up where you're at. Well, you know, it's as, you know, plants and vines, I guess you'd say, my uh, my my route to the begonia collection was circuitous at best. But I, um, I was a uh, right fresh out of college. I went into retail management. Mm-hmm. I had uh, went to school for for uh, basically foreign language, uh, French and Spanish, and I could talk to people. So uh, I did that for around twenty five years um, with big box retailers. Okay, so I have a ton of people, public interfacing experience, and then. Uh, as most people do, you go through these life changes and then you decide, or I did, I decided that I was like, I'm not really terribly happy with this. I feel very beat up every day when I get home emotionally. And so Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, the only thing that was really a constant in my life were plants. My mom had a greenhouse growing up. And so I spent my childhood playing with like bone meal and blood meal <laughs> and rooting hormone where most kids are, you know, playing with, uh, you know, like little army figures and things like that, you know, outside with their, with their cousins or family. So, so I, I had this really, I think it, I think it's kind of odd now, but now I'm glad that I did because it really gave me some very solid footing for what I do now. Mm-hmm. So shorten it. Uh, in 2010, I went back, got some, I re-educated myself, um, went and did a fair amount of horticulture and landscape design work for a number of years. And then this really interesting opportunity at the Fort Worth Botanic Garden became available as the irrigation manager. And I am a certified irrigator or licensed irrigator in Texas. And so I interviewed, got the job and um, unfortunately, our our existing begonia curator retired uh, two years ago this May. And so it was right up my alley. I have grown begonias for years, um, probably around 15 years. And 
And so I, you know, I'm a plant person mm-hmm. at heart, not necessarily an irrigation person <laughs> at heart. That requires a lot of digging, but yeah. you know, I, uh, I, I came back full circle back to plants from what I grew up as a child. And, um, and so I interviewed like most, there were several, quite a few, and I had the best greenhouse experience of all the interviewees. And I don't want to discount that because we had some tough, mm-hmm. I mean, on staff, um, that interviewed and they were, they were really talented and are talented. So I, uh, I felt like, guess what? I pinched myself every time I walk into both of these greenhouses and say, I won the lottery. Yeah, but you earned it. You know, when it's sort of like when people say, oh, you're so lucky to have this job, but there's no, there's not a lot of luck. You know, it's hard work and, 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 you know, your, your knowledge is, is pretty amazing. So yeah, it's lucky that you were, you know, you made those, decided to make those changes in life. It's lucky that maybe the person decided to retire when they did, but you know, it's, it's, it's not winning the lottery. (laughs) That's pure luck. Okay. Well, you know, maybe a little bit, a little bit, but I, I do, I love all plants. Mm -hmm. I love tropicals. They're my favorite. And begonias just really fall right in line with all of those. And and to be quite honest, the first I, I didn't like begonias. What at first? <laughs> I know it's it's like people How I say, I tell people that? this story, and they they um they're they like what? And you're the begonia curator. What ha, what WTF, Glenn? Well, and so uh, I I told them it's like. My experience as a landscape designer was Mm -hmm. all of the that you use in landscapes outside, especially in Texas, since we are located in Texas. I I will, I will say the two, uh, two plants that I really, well, three plants that I really hate because of bad experiences, pyracantha, just because, you know, the thorns go through your hands, Um, canna lilies and wax begonias because of snail collecting. And most oh, people do yes. think of, and, and I think this is probably the same with Texas, is wax begonias is one of your just common bedding plants. And it is the ugliest begonia of all the begonias, but, you know, it's pretty darn hardy. But if you've ever had to collect buckets of snails underneath wax begonias, you do hate them. So I can't say that. I mean, I don't hate all begonias, but I, I sure do hate wax begonias. Right. Well, and and the wax begonias that people see are just so heavily hybridized mm-hmm. now. Some of the new varieties coming out are really beautiful and interesting, but my experience was, you know, you I had to put tons of these plants in people's yards. They were, you know, they just seemed very, really common and, and pedestrian, I guess. And first freeze, they just turned to mush. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that was, and then you have to go pull them all out and it's disgusting. So that was that was my first experience really with begonias. And then I had the chance to tour the begonia collection at the at the Fort Worth Botanic Garden and I saw all of the variation and sizes and flowers and I was like what these are begonias what who where did these come from and so um, the, the prior curator, Debbie, um, was such a sweet lady and, um, she was so patient with everyone on this tour. And I was like, you know what, this would be such a wonderful place to work. I love it. And, Mm -hmm. and that's, I think that was the seed for me. And I've always loved the Fort Worth Botanic Garden. And so I, I ended up coming, coming full circle back around. Oh, so I, I was surprised when you said, um, I think the you said it's the Fort Worth Botanic Gardens has the largest collections of begonias in North America. Is that was that correct? That is that is correct. Wow. We have um, and we are recognized through uh, APGA, which is the American Public Garden Association, through their Plant Collections Network, and it was titled. I think NPCC, which was National Plant Collections Consortium before, but now it's um, that was in 2014, was recognized um, then. And so we've only increased the number of plants 
and the diversity that we have in the collection today. And, and what numbers, like what spe- how many species do you have? Do you know? We, fl- we fluctuate. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have in between 1,100 oh. and 1,600 taxa. Wow. So these are all individually named plants, and that's a combination of species, begonias, and uh, hybrids mm-hmm. slash cultivars. So some of the hybrids aren't really in cultivation because they're heritage hybrids that we we call them heritage hybrids because they are so old. But uh, but we still have some that are significant historically. And and are all these grown under glass? Or do you have a screen house? Because um, I imagine Fort Worth is similar in climate to um, what zone is Fort Worth? We we border two zones. It's seven B eight A. Okay, all right. So, so depending depending on the winter, mm-hmm. you know, they really say, "Oh, you're more seven B this year," or "Oh, you're eight A this year." So it really really depends because we can. I mean, uh, I think like two years ago, we got down to uh, zero as winter during one snap. It was really miserable, to be honest. But fortunately, we didn't lose power in the northern in at the garden. Uh, But Texas, uh, if everyone remembers it, you know, the power. uh, Oh, yeah, that's right. lots, Lots of power. And there were. Uh, literally millions of people without power during that storm, but uh, we have uh, we have power, so we didn't lose power, which would have been devastating for the collection because they're all tropical, subtropical plants. But um, we have uh, at any given moment, it's probably close to around five thousand plants <sighs> in in both greenhouses, and that's all begonias. Um, we usually keep around two to three of each named species okay. plant uh, because, you know, God forbid we lose one and then you don't have a backup. I call it the it. air and the spare. You know, everyone's familiar yeah. with that with now since <laughs> the book spare, but I, yes. I've called that for years. We have a greenhouse and then we have an air and we have a spare. <laughs> right. We don't we don't have very many outside. I'm mm-hmm. working on that. I've become curator because I'm like we are underutilizing our collection as a as a whole because who really knows that we have the largest collection of begonias in North America except for me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, well, it does me no good except that I get to walk through them every day. <laughs> but oh. but uh and, and but are, that are- are both greenhouses open to the public or do you have one that's sort of the display and then you have your propagation backup greenhouse? Actually, both greenhouses, um, and and I'll tell you, they are 7,000 square foot oh. for our hybrid slash cultivar house and 6,000 square foot for our species house. And um, they are they are open to the public. But it's by reservation and scheduled tour only. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. I guess I'll have to schedule. Just because of the nature <laughs> of, I mean, it is the actual collection. It's not the display portion. Mm-hmm. I am working on um, re reworking and redesigning. We have an ex- exhibition greenhouse that's smaller, but uh, it used to house begonias normally, but then there were some, there were some, uh, I guess, some maintenance issues overall, and they kind of just went away as botanic gardens do mm-hmm. that, you know, they, they change design plans and priorities. So, um, so I'm reworking that to have an actual space that people can walk through and into and view them without having to schedule okay. an appointment. But I, I readily tour. I love talking about them and showing people and educating um, overall. Yeah, because I think people, they are, you know, you talk about tropical and subtropical, but where they're sort of native to various lo- locales. Can you sort of explain right. their 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 habitat range their and their native habitats? Yes. So... Uh, to make it simple, I like to imagine you see the globe and you see the equator, which is right around the middle, and you hug it. 
with your arms. Well, that's where begonias are because they love the planet. They're hugging the planet. That's what I tell people. <laughs> anyway, so um, so they 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 are native to uh, subtropical tropical regions around the world. Um, they there are none native to the continental U.S. Okay, which I know, which I think is almost a little ironic. Yeah, uh, exactly. But they are native to Mexico. Central and South America, and then tropical Africa, Madagascar, and then Indonesia and Asia. They are not native to Australia, um, uh, New Guinea, uh, all of those areas, just all around. If you imagine the Tropic of Cancer, then the equator, and then the Tropic of Capricorn, that's basically where all begonias can be found. Got it. And and as far as their their so you know they they like tropical subtropical, um, there's no I mean they're pretty much all understory or there are some ones that grow up on slopes. Um, there's no epiphytic true epiphytic begonias. There are some that are climbing. Um, so they have different habitats like that, or. Yes, I mean there. Well, they there are there there are dry forest, dry rainforest, or dry tropical forest, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, rainforest. Then you have uh, uh, high elevation, yeah, begonias, and which is super cool. There are also begonias that grow right next to cacti in deserts. Wow. Wow, I know okay. I said that's so cool. Yeah. There was an image on the back of one of the begonian um periodicals and this is a a publication that the American Begonia Society prints um uh every two months throughout the year and if you're a member which you can just go to uh, the ABS website um and if you don't mind me plugging it it's no, begonias.org it. yeah. mm-hmm. and Begonias with an S.org, you can go and become a, a member because they um they support our collection uh as well as individual members or individual people that that also support it because we are a heavily donation driven uh collection. Okay. Well that's that that's good. Yeah, because I, I think that's probably one of the biggest one of the problems that people make growing begonias is they sort of treat them like they're all from the same type of environment, same growing conditions. And most people, I think, think that the begonias like to stay wet and moist and usually see people rot them out. So it's interesting that, that some are from deserts growing with cacti and, um, you know, and others just want it cool, like a more of a mountainous, like a cloud forest type environment. Yes, that's um, exactly it. I like to, that's when I, when people, when I talk about care overall, I usually tell people when they say, oh, I can't grow, I can't grow that. It's too finicky. I say, well, it's because you love it to death. <laughs> exactly. I say that. That's why I always tell people that <laughs> you love your plant to death. Usually that means yes. overwatering it. And that's and that's usually the case. It's, um, I have I have begonias at home because I'm a glutton for punishment, and um, and they when people see them they're like, oh my god, how do you do that? And it's like, well, to be quite honest, it's abject neglect. <laughs> Just leave them alone. They don't yeah. need us. They've been growing for millions of years with without any intervention from humans. I'm pretty sure they can handle a few months without without me really worrying about them too yeah. much. Yeah. But I, I think people do fall and I'm guilty too, is, you know, some of those Rex begonias that are put on the market are just absolutely amazing. Um, but before we go into that, because I'm going to ask you from some growing tips on those, um, besides also growing in different environments within that, you know, the sort of that uh, equator line, is there are different types. There's cane begonias, mm-hmm. Rex begonias, tuberous begonias, and rhizomatous begonias. And can yes. you sort of just briefly, and I'm sure I missed some other ones, can you briefly explain um, what the differences are? So when people are looking at one and they're like, oh, okay, that's what that means. So I'll go to, um, you know, that we there are really what we refer to as eight types of begonias. And okay. I, um, 
when I look at when I look on the internet, because you can find everything. God love the internet because it makes it so easy to find information, but you never know how accurate that information is. So that's mm-hmm. the one caveat I will say. Yep. And you see lots of different advice, um, but <clears throat> all bigo- begonias are they're fibrous rooted. They're not deep. They don't have a tap root. So when you see that listed as a type of begonia, it's it's they're all that way. They're not they're not they're not one or the other. But the rhizomatous is the largest group. And just so everyone knows, I think um, probably last at the end of February, uh, there were 2,117 species of begonias okay. and over 15,000 hybrids. Yeah. And it's been that way for at least a year. I just say over that because, wow. you know, it seems like every day there's mm-hmm. like 30, or 30 new new cultivars out there that you could get. But Rhizomatus is the largest group. And um, how I like to describe that is it has its stem kind of laying flat on the soil surface, kind of partially buried in, but not completely. So you can see it growing flat. And so each of the the, the uh, stems that connects the leaf to that big stem, and they can be really thick depending on the type uh, or depending on the species. So uh, each one, uh, it could be as thick as your wrist or mm-hmm. forearm yeah. for a rhizome. And um, it sometimes they're, they're super interesting. They're speckled. You can see some of the old uh, spots where the leaves have fallen, uh, leaves have fallen away. The petiole has abscissed away off of, off of the uh, um, rhizome. Uh, and, they usually have larger leaves. One of the one of the indicators for begonias is that the leaves are all asymmetrical. So if you took a uh, leaf and you just divided it in half anywhere along one of the veins of that leaf, it's never going to be equal. Each side is is uh, they're different sizes. Yeah, they're one of the and- easiest families to ID because of their leaves. Yes, so, they are. Mm-hmm. I mean, the leaves are pretty, um, they're pretty uh, iconic when it comes to looking at that that particular leaf. They're usually, a lot of them are shaped like half of a wing. Mm-hmm. And, and that, mm-hmm. I think it's the easiest way to describe it. If you took uh, a pair of wings on the back of a bird and you uh, make them look like you'd see an angel that's pretty much very typically a begonia leaf in some form, sometimes larger, fatter, squatter, but always that that general overall shape. Mm-hmm. Um, then you have cane-like, which are going to be like your angel wing begonias, which most people have heard angel wing. Oh, my mom has an angel wing. This is the this is the favorite. They they grow more upright, and their stem looks like a, a cane, almost like bamboo. With the spacing in between the uh, nodes of the the leaves, there, uh, pretty pretty typical. Uh, you have Semper Florence, like you talked about, the wax leaf begonias, ever blooming is what that means, or forever blooming, I think. Uh, you have thick stemmed, which are going to be some that that grow very tall, upright. I think typically in the jungles, which is the tropical jungles where they're located, there's a lot of vegetation located around them. And so they they can kind of grow more upright, but the main difference between um, the thick stem and say a, a woody tree is that they're, they're fleshy, they're herbaceous. Mm-hmm. They don't have the woody fibers that uh, a tree has. And so if it doesn't have the support of the forest around it, it will fall over and either snap or where it makes contact with the ground, it will send out adventitious roots and form, it could form a new plant. These uh, thick stemmed can grow upwards of around 15 feet tall. Oh, oh, wow. Yes. I've seen a picture of uh, one in Asia and the node and inner node section. So the inner node is the space between each of the nodes. It um, was the size of a man's femur. Holy moly. Wow. What what species was and, that? Not that I probably uh, recognize it, but. 
it at at the time it was still considered a U, I believe. Okay. Uh, which the yeah. American Begonia Society, um, when a when a plant is undescribed mm-hmm. or unknown, it gets assigned a U number. And currently, we're up to uh, the seven hundreds. Oh. And it's just been going on for decades. Yeah. And so eventually that U number will get described botanically and then it will get a name based on either who collected, discovered it, or uh, a person that the botanist who described it went through the, the begonia key and went through and found that it was a, a new begonia. And then they get to name it um, usually uh, again. Uh, for someone they they're honoring it's usually honorific or yeah. it's a place name yeah that would be pretty amazing to see i mean that would be even more amazing to grow but <laughs> like right. you said they well, you, some- you do need a tall space yeah I, I have um one and it's one of the largest uh it's called colosa c-a-l-l-o-s-a begonia colosa okay and it has this fluting on the stem and it's probably, I have one that's at least an inch, inch and a half uh, diameter wow. and it's around eight or nine feet tall right now. And oh. so, and it's in, in one of the greenhouses. I do have it supported yeah. because it would not be that tall mm-hmm. otherwise, but I do have a few that I've allowed to grow as they would normally, even though they're all in like 12 or 14 inch pots. So that's so fun. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's fun. And they don't, grow. they don't mind being root bound. Mm-hmm. They actually really like being root bound uh, for whatever reason, but, but it also means that you have to water them more frequently yeah. because they dry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then you have trailing scandent, which uh, imagine a hanging basket and a and a with a really beautiful uh, pothos golden ivy in it. Well, that's pretty much what these begonias like to do, and they uh, they're super interesting. We have some in our species house, and what happens is they'll trail over the edge of our uh, greenhouse benches, and they'll get into the gravel underneath the benches oh, yeah. and go there, and then they'll die out in the pot above. It's really you know, funny. Mm-hmm. They don't like being up high. They want to be down where it's really shady and much more humid than on a on a artificial <laughs> uh, greenhouse bench. So, so sometimes you just like let the plants find where they want to grow. You're like, okay, that's where you want to do it. All right. Yeah, we have we have a few that are like that that we actually put the uh, the label in with it just because it's, it's like, okay, I'm not going to fight this anymore. It's just going to be better just yeah. to let the plant do what it wants to do. Yeah. Oh, how interesting. Okay. So then we have those. And then you said, eight. and then, um, I, I'll talk about Rex. Mm-hmm. So, which is what most people see, but it's called the Rex cultorum because there is only one of this species. Oh, <laughs> it's technically rhizomatous, mm-hmm. technically, but because every other plant in this group, they're all hybrids, cultivars. They're a mixture of this Rex, and it's super, it wants to hybridize much more than a lot of the others do. And so hybridizing the Rex is easier. Um, but any of the plants that have that Rex original genetics in it, are always referred to as Rex. Got it. They're a Rex okay. group, a Rex cultorum. And so same thing applies. Um, uh, there, I've seen uh, one from, I believe, Vietnam, and then one from India, and one from China, and they're all pretty similar. Uh, I think the one, we have one that we acquired from uh, Toyama Botanic Garden, and the leaves on that one, for some reason, always are larger than the other rexes hmm. that are rex species. So I think it probably has to do with some of the variability because mm-hmm. begonias are super variable based on their growing conditions. They can look like completely different plants, which I think is really cool, too, because they're plants. Um with, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'll go. I just want to briefly say because yeah, you were showing sure. the breva, breva. I could never pronounce it. The red one, and I thought uh, Yes, and I thought ours was just because of the light, 
And then you showed me a picture. So it, it would be, you know, unless you're an expert, sometimes you're like, well, that's because of the, the growing conditions or that's just the variableness of the plant. But um, so, yeah, it's hard. But you're like, no, that's a completely or I guess it is the same species you said. Yes. Um, yes. It's just okay. a different. Um, it could be a different form. They're called okay. forms. Yeah. When you've got these plants that that have they have these natural evolutions I think a lot of it is based on geography and where they are mm -hmm. inside their their habitats. Those are basically islands, almost like a true island out in the ocean. You have these geographical areas that are completely isolated. Yeah. And so they just make do with what they've got. Yeah. Um, I do want to come back to the wrecks, but we'll continue because... <laughs> I do want to talk about Rex and why people have a love hate yes. relationship with that. Yeah, definitely. Rex, <laughs> I mean, Rex could be like a two hour long talk it, altogether. It, it could be. It could, it, like a therapy session. But, <laughs> but we'll get some tips from you. But okay. Um, okay. So besides Rex, then we see you have tuberous. Tuberous. Mm hmm. And so you get to experience tuberous way more than I get to. And I'm jealous because. California has a much better climate than Texas does for growing tuberous. They like a much cooler temperature overall um, than our Texas heat. And just to kind of give, you know, your listeners a an idea, um, we had last year 90 plus days of triple digit heat and no rain last summer. Yeah. So that's how hot it gets. So it, inside of a greenhouse, guess what? It's warmer. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I mean, it gets way warmer. Yeah. Now we do have cooling systems and things like that, that mm -hmm. help to, to, to kind of minimize that. But, but the begonias for us in the summer do suffer. They, they look pretty terrible in the fall, early fall coming out of summer when the temperatures start to moderate. So. Yeah. I'm in this, but, I'm in the central Valley. So yeah, we had, you know, we, we didn't get any winter rain last year. We're making up for it this year, but we got like no winter rain. We don't get summer rain. And I think we had, um, I don't know how many days of over a hundred we have. I don't think we had that many days, but we had several 113, 116 days. Um, so Central Valley of California is very similar to Texas without the humidity. Yes. Yeah, but, that would that would be very similar. Yeah, then. but where are those tuberous begonias are just magnificent is the Medicino Botanic Gardens. Um, oh, right along okay. the coast. I think they're known for that. Anywhere along the coast, you could just grow those. So they, they do struggle. They do struggle inland. Um, but the coastal people, uh, <laughs> they could so just grow any, baskets of any, them. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying they could just grow baskets of them. And they're just these, you know, clusters of these beautiful flowers. Yes, I I absolutely agree. Um, we have one that is a species uh, uh, tuberous. It's called Boliviensis. Mm -hmm. So you can. Uh, so where's it from? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bolivia. Uh huh. So I usually ask people that, but it has this unbelievably kind of scarlet orange flower, which is unusual for begonias. Uh -huh. uh, oranges and yellows are a not common color. And I, I'll remind me about color, flower color and I'll come back to that because it's really important to talk about that. Uh, but they have this kind of tubular shaped flower that's different, even though they have the same number of petals um, that all the other begonias have, because that's one of the identifiers for them. But, uh, but just absolutely gorgeous. And people grow them in baskets where they can. And just you have these huge cascading arches of uh of uh almost like canes but not quite mm -hmm. but but they arch and they kind of uh cascade over almost like a fountain and they're just full of flowers and it's really a stunning stunning uh beautiful flower and this is the species of this and they're using it to hybrid but it's got a tuber that's probably the size of um uh, you know the little the kids water wings when they get in the in the pool yeah it's about uh -huh. that size diameter yeah. around like a donut almost the tuber is in the ground a lot of times we have one that's like that okay anyway. yeah that's bigger I grew one I actually that one is a little more um forgiving for the heat in it is. In, in Central Valley and we're, in fact we're growing it in the desert room more so than in the tropical room 
Um, I think because we're able to, it, it doesn't mind the dry air. And then, in, yeah, I, I don't know. We had two going and the one in the desert room is much happier than the one in the tropical room. And you know um, why that is, don't you? Um, they're probably in a drier spot of Bolivia, I'm guessing. I, I think so. And most of the tuberous begonias want extremely well draining mm-hmm. soil. They want fast water because that tuber, all it does is store water. So they tend to rot if they mm-hmm. stay too wet. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we found is it's just much happier. Um, so yeah, it is, it is an, a, a, an easier to grow one than a lot of the other showy tuberous ones, which I think don't take the heat so much for us. It, so. And that's the one that we have. Um, all the other uh, tuberous begonias are species begonias mm-hmm. from different regions around mm-hmm. the world. We d- we have no hybrid yeah. cultivar tuberous. They just don't make it. We've tried and tried and tried. Ugh. And finally, we gave up and yeah. said, we just can't. And you can't bear to see them die on us I every know. year. I almost don't even think of them as begonias anymore when I think about begonias because I've had to push them out of my mind so much. <laughs> right. Well, I they look very Almost carnation like. Uh, very, to me. yeah, yeah. I mean, well, they have a lot of petals. I guess you mm-hmm. know, not not the species, but the hybrids. Um, so yeah, yes. they don't really have that that begonia look, but mm-hmm. they're gorgeous. Yeah, they 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 sure don't. Um, but last but not least of all the begonia types, they're shrub like, mm. and so they're kind of a mounding. Um, they some of them can get large. We have one that's called Foliosa miniata, and miniata is the varietal name of it. Um, it has this beautiful red flower, and it it comes up in this central spire, and then the sides kind of arch left and arch right, and it's gorgeous, and it blooms so often. And that's one of the things about all the begonias is that the rhizomatous bloom in the winter. They um, they are just about to come out of their their bloom cycle. So my um, uh, hybrid house is still just absolutely amazing with blooms mm-hmm. right now. Um, cane begonias bloom intermittently year round. Um, they just bloom whenever they're ready. I, I I I don't know that it's you know based on. I think uh, rhizomatous. It's based on night length um, for the most part. You know how what triggers them to mm-hmm. to bloom. But cane, I've no idea. I think if they're happy, they're going to bloom. Yeah, I, those ones I think do. See, people have a lot of them. They tend to be a, a common or house plant because they are one easier to grow, and they do. I, I, it seems like they just put on a lot of blooms all the time. And then, um, and then all of the rest, like the, the trailing scanned it, it, they just don't bloom very often, but when they do, it's usually small, small blooms, Rex. And I think Rexes get a bad rap <laughs> just so you know. Okay. I mean, they get, they get a bad reputation uh-huh. that, oh, they don't have pretty flowers. Oh, Okay. Guess what? The Rex flowers are so cool. They are big. The female flowers are just huge. And people are like, well, they they only want the leaves because the leaves are so striking. And I'm like, yeah, but there's those flowers. Those are something. Those are huge. They're gorgeous. Well, let's talk about growing Rex begonias. Let's just lead okay. into it because those are the ones that you see primarily at the the stores, I mean, there's a lot, but the ones that you see like, you know, at the grocery store or in the front of the nursery, right? because they have such the wow factor, they have amazing foliage, but a lot of people, I mean, including myself, kill them. Mm -hmm. Um, You love them to death. (laughs) (laughs) No, because I'm a horrible at water and I'm like, no, not watering you. No, not watering. So maybe it's my neglect actually that you know, I, yeah, I neglect uh, them to death, but what are some, what are some tips? So let's go on to what okay. soil would you grow Rex begonia in? What size pot and mm-hmm. where would you place it? So a lot of these are going to be what, um, they're going to be situational, I think is the best, best way to describe okay. it as with most. And I'll talk about the size of the pot first mm-hmm. and then we'll go into okay. the soil. Um, Size of the pot is always uh, in direct uh, correlation to the size of the plant. Okay. So if it's a if it's a tiny little plant, 
you would, you know, no bigger than, uh, say, uh, a few inches across for that whole plant, all of the, all the leaves, you would never put it in like a 10 inch pot mm-hmm. just because it's, it, 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 it's going to hold water in the soil mix way too much. And it's just going to rot the roots and you'll have again, succeeded in killing your plant. So, yeah. um, but uh, you want it to be uh, related to the size of the begonia. So not, not really much larger than the plant itself. So when we, when we start new props, new propagation uh, uh, begonias, new propagules, we typically start them off in four inch pots um as a new plant and that's that's pretty standard across across all of us unless it's something truly special and the then you would have specialty pots for them but i um we have two separate soil mixes that we use in the greenhouse and and i want to 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 absolutely um qualify why we do that but it's always related to the environmental conditions you have in your house Mm -hmm where you're growing okay. is going to truly determine the type of soil media that you use. We use a, a we call it a bark mix, which is peat moss, uh, perlite, and uh, a, a pine bark, which has a mycorrhizal fungal inoculation to help them metabolize uh, new nutrients in that, in that soil. And we do fertilize and I'll talk about that as well, but, uh, that is a pretty well draining mix initially, but over time you have to go back and you have to change it because as that material decomposes, it compacts and that's where people see the problems occur. And then they start to see their begonia decline. We have it happen in the greenhouse as well. And as soon as we see it, we we come over we we um we call it tickling or teasing the roots mm-hmm. so that mm-hmm. you're you're getting some of the exterior soil off you're breaking it out and then you want to try to get as much of that out as possible i i prefer to either dip it in a bucket of kind of tap warm water not warm not cold so that you're not shocking those roots, but in a lot of that soil media will fall away and then you can repot it up in, uh, in the, I guess the, your favorite, it really boils down to, um, soil media, but we have another soil media that is, um, it's really just the, the peat, um, and the, uh, perlite without the bark. Okay. And so we'll use that for smaller plants a lot of times, just because we don't want the, the, um, water to drain as quickly. And so these two soil, soil media mixes that we're using are specifically attuned to our greenhouse Mm -hmm. because we have a high humid greenhouse, greenhouses, and, um, we need the water to drain out quicker than, uh, than you would probably normally see it in a um, a store bought mix that most people are going to be apt to buy. So I have a, um, I have a few questions. Are these equal part peat moss, um, perlite, and that pine bark, and then equal parts peat moss and perlite? So it's like a fifty fifty. No, it's going to be a three. It's a three one one. So it's going to be three parts perlite, one part. Uh, I'm sorry, three parts peat, one part perlite, one part bark. Okay, just so okay. that you have. More mm-hmm. peat, and okay. the same thing on the on the other mix without the bark. It's just a okay. three one. So that's actually a heavier, um, like especially your your peat moss and your perlite. That's actually a heavier mix than, and, and like you said, it really depends on your conditions and who you have watering. Uh, yes, because most people love them to death, meaning they overwater them, and so a lot of a them, little heavy handed. Yeah, so even when you buy a Rex begonia, they're typically almost in straight peat moss. And I think people then just continue to water them, whereas you're maybe moving it to just a peat moss and perlite, but that perlite's allowing for a lot of more more aeration and drainage than what it's coming in. And then 
you're not nearly watering as probably as most people are thinking. And then, right. you know, when people see a plant wilting because they're over water, uh, watering it and rotting it, they water it even more. Right, so. exactly. And so, and so that's one thing that I tell every single person. They always ask me, well, how often should I water? I said, well, you should water when your plant tells you it, it needs you to water it. And they kind of look at me like, oh, my God, did he just say that in a foreign language? And I have no clue what he's talking about. So I, I, again, I I go and I'm like, well, you have the best water meter in the world at your fingertips, Mm -hmm. your finger, your index finger. Put your finger in that pot down to the first or second knuckle. And if you pull it out like a toothpick in a cake and it's covered in moist, damp soil, guess what? Wait a day. Come back and check it again. Yeah. Check it again, not come back and water it again, come back and check it again. And you check it until you get to this dry top portion of the soil. And you don't want the soil to separate from the interior of the pot and create Mm -hmm. this little puck inside of inside of your pot. But you also don't want it to stay what I call sopping wet. I think that's that. Yep. I don't know if that's a Texas term or not. I but. say that. I'm glad you say okay. it because I say that all the time, sopping wet. And I write it and I'm like, do people know what I'm talking about? But yeah, sopping <laughs> wet. I get it. it totally makes sense. <laughs> yes. I mean, you don't, you never want that because a lot of people don't under, understand soil mechanics. Mm-hmm. And the mechanics are there are all these different particles that are all these different sizes. And so there's space in between those particles. Well, that space is filled with air because roots breathe. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important whenever you, whenever I tell people that roots breathe, they look at me again, like I'm, like I have three heads and I'm an alien (laughs) and, and say, huh? And I'm like, yes, roots need air almost more than they need water. And they're, and sometimes it's that, that light bulb epiphanal moment when I, I may have, just, I just had a moment where I think I, it's like the angel gets its wings bell. <laughs> yeah. So, it's that ding. Yes. And so I, uh, I go, yeah, they, they need to breathe. And so when you water in that soil media, you are pushing out all of that air. So the more often you water, the less air that you have in your soil. And so you are drowning your roots mm-hmm. and you, and then when you get to the soil and it smells really bad and sour, that that's that um, non-oxygen bacteria really flourishing and you don't want that. Yeah. And you you mentioned like, I like how you mentioned, you use the term puck because I always say the root ball when it gets, especially peat moss, when it dries, it pulls away and peat moss is really hard to re-wet. So a lot of times when you tell people, oh, water, so water flows out the bottom, if it's so dry, it's going to the path mm-hmm. of least resistant, which is out around the sides and you're in fact not watering your plant. Exactly. So. And so if if that happens, this is the easiest way to fix that. And that is take a saucer or some kind of dish that has about an inch depth to it. And you can use a, a bucket or anything, water like you would normally and let that water pour out, but leave that pot sitting in it. And that will allow, because that, that, that soil is hydrophobic. Mm-hmm. It repels water and just like your kitchen sponge does. And, and that's one of the, the uh, visuals that I give people is that imagine that soil is like your kitchen sponge and it just sloughs water off, but a little bit of water got in. And then the more times you do that, the more that sponge is able to absorb more water. Well, the soil is exactly the same way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I always equate soil with a sponge as well that it, it's there, it's soaking up the water and you need the roots to pick up that water in there. So um, so those are the two soil mixes for all your begonias or just the Rex mm-hmm. begonias? For all your begonias? No, just just the Rex. Okay. Now, yeah. we do have roughly around 800 terrarium begonias in the collection. Oh, yeah. So, and, and this is very, what... I, I heard this term the other day and I thought it was, I thought it was, it was new for me. And, and I said, imagine a, tr- a greenhouse inside of a greenhouse. And she said, oh, that's so meta. And I was like, <laughs> oh, that's cool. Uh, that's a new, a new way to describe it because. 
it's this bigger this these little smaller greenhouses inside this bigger greenhouse because even inside of our greenhouse our environmental conditions are not perfect yeah yeah so some of these begonias want higher humidity um but they don't want again to be sopping wet mm-hmm. so in these um terrariums we use a couple of different um medias and so these become pretty custom and most people can do this we call it uh one is called the milli mix and if anyone has ever grown begonias they'll they'll know the reference to Millie and Ed Thompson's book about begonias it, we call it the bible <laughs> because it was it was written in the i believe the 70s don't quote me on that i don't remember the copyright but Millie Thompson and her husband, they were commercial plumbers, but yet they grew begonias expertly. And um, and so they decided to write a book because there was so little literature on it. And so this soil media that she developed over time was three parts long fiber sphagnum okay. and one part perlite. And so what we do... Um, at the collection is we used to boil it. We would Uh-oh. boil the sphagnum, pull it out, let it, let it drain and, and dry out. But we found that we were getting a, a fair amount of bacterial growth inside of it over the long term. Mm. And so now we we simply rinse it under really hot water. And then we'll take that, those long fibers and then squeeze the water and cut cut them into smaller pieces with a pair of like large shears or um, like your shop scissors, things like that. And that kind of breaks it down a little further and then we'll mix in the perlite with it and we'll keep that. You can put it in a bin anywhere. And there are some that really like this because they need that extra, that extra space in between all of those uh, particles, but long fiber sphagnum holds moisture really well. And so the, it has access to that water as well. So rinsing it in hot water, is that getting rid of the small particular matters, like trying to slough off anything so you don't have more dense, or is it to clean it? Both. Both. Okay. I think it does both. It it really cleans it. If there's any, if there are any pathogens that are left mm-hmm. from the, from the uh, manufacturing process, that it helps to eliminate the vast majority of those. Okay. And the size perlite, because I mean, we have various, I mean, most people could get their hands on just the standard size, but there's pretty small perlite and there's big perlite. It's a standard, it's just a standard okay. perlite, you know, okay. she, I think, you know, back, back when she was writing this book, they didn't have access to all these really individual perlites that yeah. are available now. Yeah. You, I, I'm taking notes like crazy. And normally a lot of times when I'm talking to people, I'm not taking notes, but I'm picking your brain for my <laughs> growth. So that's why I'm asking all these detailed questions because I'm like, wait a minute. Um, but it has to be, it has to be pretty easy, pretty straightforward. And we've mm-hmm. found that, you know, the vast majority of the begonias in the terrariums, they they they're pretty adaptable when it comes to their soil conditions, as long as their environmental conditions are pretty pretty okay. good. And I think when you visited, you said that you you have these individual specimens, and it's not like just in this big terrarium. You have them enclosed each. And what is it that you you told me that you use? <laughs> so you know we have these extremely technical. And very specific restaurant salad containers <laughs> that one is the lids are inverted one on the other with clips. And so I didn't come up with this. The collection did it over time because they were always and have always been strapped for cash to maintain this collection. Um, just so that I can talk about this, just because it, I want people to know that I am the only paid staff for that collection. Mm. Um, all of the rest of the help, and it requires an army. It's heavily volunteer driven. I have the largest group of volunteers on our campus. And um, we have uh, probably, I think, close to 50 volunteers, not all at one time. Yeah, no, but still, that's amazing. And so it requires a, a really dedicated group of volunteers to do that. So 
the history of the collection is that um, we had a group of ladies uh, from the from the Metroplex, from the DFW area that um, were grow- they were learning how to grow begonias at home because begonias are, you know, an, a really um, an older traditional house plant. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people have heard of the beefsteak begonia, which is technically called uh, begonia erythrophylla. And that's the oldest hybrid begonia, hybridized in 1845. So um, they've been around for a minute. Yeah. And and so uh, they, uh, I, I almost lose my train of thought now because <laughs> I started, I, I wanted to say who hybridized it, but oh. uh, but it's okay. It's not a big deal. I was going to say, you, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm sure you can make up a name and no one would know. No, just kidding. Right. Oh, his name is Javon Varsivix. I, I oh, know wow. that. There that's, you go. that's easy. <laughs> you know. You know. I think he's either Dutch or German. Don't okay. hold me yeah, on, I won't. on who and and where he he's from. But he hybridized that first begonia. So, um, but um, so you had. These- I know that we. Were- talking about the soil mixes and the, oh, the history of the collection. I'm sorry. That's what it was. So, um, so these, these ladies were coming um, to the garden because they had heard that we had some begonias and they wanted to see it. Well, we had a few in one of our, um, that we call it the, uh, the Quonset hut now because it's a Quonset style greenhouse. And um, this was in the very late sixties, early seventies. And uh, when they walked through, I think back then they had much better access to our admin, uh, administrative Mm -hmm. leadership. And so they were actually talking to the director of the garden at the time and said, hey, you know, we would love it if you had a begonia collection here at the Fort Worth Botanic Garden. And he said, well, you know what? We would too. But if you want it here, you have to help us. (laughs) And so that was how it started. And so these ladies started, it grew from, I think, roughly around 10 begonias to where we are today with over 5,000 begonias. That's crazy. And well, I mean, it just goes to show you the power of volunteers. I mean, most, most garden clubs, most botanic gardens, even if they have a lot of money, still have amazing volunteers. I mean, it's just people do want to volunteer for plants, but, um, it could be hard wrangling all the volunteers though. (laughs) say it It, is um i on volunteer days i'm extremely busy i mm -hmm. get i get no uh other work done Mm -hmm. and i and i love it because i'm getting i'm still getting i'm not getting my work done but i'm getting work for the collection done exactly and so many people want to come and volunteer at the conservatory and um usually we have them you know students go through our internship program but i hate turning away other people and i'm like i need to start doing something where i train them but you can't just people have people come volunteer because even if they know what they're doing, it's just what how you do it and your you know your setup and where everything's at, mm-hmm. and it can take a lot of time. It um, does. I I typically on the on those days I spend my entire day yeah. either with the volunteers mm-hmm. um, because if I have any new volunteers come in on those on on that particular day, I tour them through the yes. collection just like I would the public because I want them to understand mm-hmm. the importance of what we're doing. Yep, and and I also recognize that when a uh, a volunteer that's new comes to the begonia collection. They they may or may it may or may not be a right fit the mm-hmm. collection or the volunteer and so I still devote the same amount of energy and effort because I might have that diamond that yeah. I I really need because I'm I'm never going to turn away someone because um, I think a lot of our current group of volunteers are I would say on the more mature end <laughs> of the scale and. And there's a ton of skill and knowledge that I would absolutely just, I would cry if it gets lost Yeah. without having a new group in constantly to help learn and and facilitate that transition of skill and knowledge. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, they are, I mean, when you, when you get volunteers and you get them going, I mean, they're, they make a a, a big difference. So, um, yeah. 
I need to get our volunteer groups going again. Um, but let's getting back to the um, the high humidity. I'm glad you brought those up because those seem to be very popular because mm-hmm. um, terrariums are popular. And so you're growing them in the salad containers and in that sphagnum mix for the most part. I mean, you said you had a lot of yes. specialty mixes, so but that's just a good one. Um, and you keep them covered and you don't put any water in the base. It's just you water the pot. Um, Mm -hmm. so they're just extra high humidity and people may know like the amphioxus, um, did I pronounce that right? That's one of them, the polka dot one. And there's a whole slew of them that have come through, um, and, and popularity, but that's a good idea because you don't need to spend a fortune to get these in, you know, you don't need to buy a fancy, they have those begonia containers. I was just looking at the the Sacramento begonia society and someone had, you know, these specialty ones, which is fine, but I like the salad bowl idea. <laughs> I, just... I we we have used so many different containers um to do so many different things. We have propagated in, you know, the rotisserie chicken containers. <laughs> yeah. I'm no joke, no lie. Uh and they they've worked pretty well. Um but we we do have some um, technical trainers like the uh, or technical containers that we that we have, like the uh, the the uh, seed trays with the plastic dome that's rectangular mm-hmm. in shape on it. That um, I, it works extremely well, um, but I have to say that with the salad bowl containers, they they fit. They've got this bowl shape, so there's a lot of space inside. But we also do use extremely technical hair clips, <laughs> you know, the little butterfly yes. and uh, dragonfly shaped clips. We have graduated to orchid clips, oh, but okay. yeah. everything works. <laughs> yeah. I mean, anything and everything. We don't we don't throw any of those items away. They age out of the system. So when one breaks and it's not good anymore, or the spring on it's gone, that's that's when that's we throw it. it away. That's it. Um, I do want to before we talk about your fertilizers and I I sort of want to go back and talk about a little bit about pot sizes for especially the Rex begonias, but what soil mixture do you use for your cane begonias? Just because that's a lot of people have the cane begonias and I know um, some of them still overwater them. I, I, they tend to be more forgiving in their soils. Am I just, I mean, that's my experience. I think it's it's fair. Um, I think that well, we use the exact same mixes for the the cane, just depending okay. on what their humidity requirements okay. are. Like um, amphioxus, that's that's a cane or a shrub. You know, they kind of they waffle between the two. They, okay. Uh, wh- about how to describe it, because begonia taxonomy is like a moving target. You know, yeah. you never know which which name it's going to have, which group it's going to be a part of, um, as far as. Um, just a one further kind of uh, rabbit hole that you could go down is that um, within the eight types, there are, I believe, 65 or 68, please don't quote me, <laughs> uh, sections of begonias. Oh, my gosh. Oh. So within each of these groups and these sections are typically based on morphology. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you can have in... Uh, uh, books based about one section of begonias, and that's been done where they they just go in and and uh, and do that. Uh, okay. We've had some researchers and doctors over the years that that have done that. Okay, um, but but when it comes to potting media, it's pretty similar. Okay. I think as long as you do not do this one thing, do okay. not use any of the ones that say moisture control. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Because they add a crystal to that potting media that holds water in longer. Mm-hmm. And begonias absolutely do not like that. They like to dry out between watering. They don't want wet feet. Okay. That's good because a lot of people think, well, you know, I overwater my plants. So I'll get this so I won't water it as much. But that's still mm-hmm. holding moisture. <laughs> so they're just... And so. I, I think another easy thing to do at home, a lot of people, you know, if you can grow an orchid or an mm-hmm. African violet, you can grow a begonia. They have very similar um, environmental needs. So, so uh, 
the amount I, I use a, a pea gravel tray underneath some if I don't have the right humidity okay. that I can that I can augment. Okay, I was about to ask you because some do like you know we just talked about the high humidity ones and we just mentioned how people could sort of circumvent that. Um, do you not recommend getting a humidifier for begonias? And how do people know if their begonias are not getting enough humidity? Well, they have this thing called the the brown edges around mm-hmm. the leaf around the leaf margin, and that's usually a sign that the begonia is drying out too quickly around the edges. And that's that's one of my first guesses. Also, the little the little um, it's called a stipule, but on the stem of the begonia, and it protects the leaf before or while it's emerging. It's this little flap of tissue, and eventually it dries up and falls away. Well, on a lot of begonias, if the humidity is higher where it likes it, it will hold on to that stipule for a long period of time. Oh, so that's a good tip. So if the stipules are browning and falling off, would you say at the same time as the leaf or bef- uh, uh, or shortly after the leaf falls off? That's Oh, nice. um I think the 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 stipules um typically will fall off well before a leaf does on their own normally. Okay. But okay. in higher humidity, you can you can make the plant hold on to those longer. And that's a that's a good indicator that you've got a healthier humidity for the begonia as is if it's browning around the edges, then that stipule will also brown and quickly fall off. Okay. It I, won't I, hold on to it. Okay. It just can't. That's a good tip. Because I'm trying to think of I have the Sophie Cecile begonia, which is one of the easiest begonias to grow. So I, I'm picturing it because it has the long canes and I I I think its stipules are all on there even though the leaves fell off. So but it's such an easy one. So that's why I was like, it's, it's, mm-hmm. but I, I like that tip. So you use the gravel under, so you're not putting the pot necessarily in water. You're not even getting a humidifier, but you have that moist gravel in the pot sort of just sitting right. on the gravel. Okay. Because as that water evaporates, mm-hmm. it creates a micro humid climate around that begonia that that you're not going to experience in the rest of your house. Most people's houses range in humidity between 30 and 40 percent, and that's just really too low for almost yeah. all begonias. Yeah, they and like then- they like they like 50 percent or higher. Okay, and I, I think 65 is like a sweet spot. Okay. I did get a humidifier for my begonias and then I quickly got powdery mildew. So, <laughs> so it was sort of a, eh, okay, humidifier, you get turned off. Apparently yeah. it's happy enough. I, it. Um, I, di- I did get powdery mildew at home and yeah. it is the bane of my existence. Mm-hmm. I think it's the bane of everybody's existence with begonias because it's so hard to clear the air of those spores that just float around. Do you use sulfur or what is your at, go-to? At the greenhouses, yes, okay. I do. Um, I like to take them outside and leave them out for a few days, spray them down. Um, you can use like a, a 50% uh, peroxide and water oh, spray. Okay. And that will wash that will wash the spores off. Um I've I've gotten advice and I haven't done this yet because it just is a lot of work and that's um it completely changing the soil out because the spores can hide in the soil. Interesting. Okay, so just a few questions with the peroxide. So 50% hydrogen peroxide, but I wouldn't recommend doing it in the freezing cold winter or in the heat of summer. That would be pretty right. shocking, right? To move them outside. Yes. Okay. Just letting yeah. people know. So um so other than that, I, I have moved some out in the forty-five degree range. Okay, and and it, but it depends on the begonia. So I'll say depends on the begonia because yeah. there are some that would absolutely not take that, and then others, if they're already acclimated to the weather, they would. Uh-huh. So um, I have it, these are these are cane begonias. So yeah. canes are usually a lot hardier than some of the others. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, besides powdery mildew, I mean, they can get a little bit of mealy bug, but they really don't get a lot of pests. I mean, spider mites aren't really a problem. Thrips aren't really a problem yes. in the greenhouse. So it tends to be just that dang powdery mildew and more environmental conditions and then maybe some mealy bugs. Mm-hmm. But I think the, some of the biggest 
things and and while they're not really uh what i'd call a pest they're a nuisance and that's fungus gnats oh yeah mm-hmm. you get the little black the little black flies yeah. that if you have a begonia close to your desk it always <laughs> finds your face <laughs> You know, it's just like, it's a magnet yeah, and and that's annoying, but, um, and that's, that's a cultural fix. Mm -hmm. You know, you, uh, you fertilize less often okay, and you let the begonia dry out more between waterings that will fix, uh, the wet environment that those fungus gnats like and want in order to, uh, proliferate. Yeah. People always have a problem with fungal gnats and I always tell them, you know, just back off the watering for, for first. And then you could get, you know, a little yellow sticky trap to get the adults to try to stop. But it is more of a cultural um, uh, practice type thing because um, they like that wet environment. Um, to, I want to go back to pot size too, because I think, and, mm-hmm. and pot type, because I think begonias of all plants, a lot of you know, you hear this plastic, no, not plastic, terracotta, no, not terracotta, more so with begonias than any other plants, I feel. And then you get to the shallow, well, not shallow. And, you know, I'm sure you're going to explain why we hear all these sort of differing opinions. Um, I'm sure there's always a little grain of truth behind why that started. But right. um, break it down for what you guys use and what you'd recommend. So I'm going to, I'm going to explain what I do at home first, Okay. Okay. because I think this is going to be completely relatable for Mm -hmm. most of your listeners. And that is I use plastic pots and I put them in a cash pot. So they are in a plastic pot inside of another pot. So again, meta because (laughs) it's a pot in a pot, Okay. but, but it's easy to pull that pot out of your cash pot and change out the plant if you ever want to, because I have display cases so that people can see them mm-hmm. that come into my home because I'm not allowed to have racks of plants at the public to see, which is what I would normally do. <laughs> and it looked like a greenhouse inside the house again. So is that what I, we call uh, a compromise? <laughs> I very possibly could, you know, I, I, for the longest time, it was a one plant in one plant out rule. Oh, wow. So one begonia in one begonia wow. out. And I was like, oh, I can't do that. That's hard. Yeah. That's like, that's like selling your children. More, more so. I mean, just kidding. I don't, uh, yes. I don't have kids. So, so, <laughs> so I, uh, so I, I do that a okay. lot okay. in those cases because two things I can, control the water very easily. If it's too wet, I can pull it out, dump what little water is just underneath that pot, Mm -hmm. which also acts to help as a humidifier. Yeah. Uh And, and then, um, because most of your cash pots are, they never, the liner, we call them liner pots in, in the trade, but these liner pots, these grower pots that I use that are plastic, they are never, the right size to fit perfectly yeah, into exactly. a into a cash pot. Yeah. They're always missized. Mm-hmm. So I find the the closest one that will work. And that way it's also decorative. It's aesthetically pleasing. And you can uh, you can enjoy it more than seeing this this ugly um green or black or orange plastic pot sitting in a really nice display case. Yeah. I like the fact that it so, does add humidity because you are sort of in creating a little enclosure for it. Mm-hmm. Almost. That's not to say there aren't challenges. I've mm-hmm. had a few that did not like that system. And so guess what? They got changed out. It's much <laughs> easier to change the plant than it is to change me. So yeah, there you go. But um, so uh terracotta. I I do like terracotta because terracotta breathes mm-hmm. much easier than your plastic pots, but It's very hard to, um, when it's time to take the plant out of the terracotta pot, because you can't kind of push the bottom of the terracotta pot unless it has a decent sized hole that your finger will fit into and you can get in and and make the roots release from the interior of the pot. Granted, you're probably not going to have to do that for at least a couple of years. So uh, just depending on if the plant's happy or Uh not. Yeah, we, we result in just breaking the terracotta pot. Just break it. Yeah. 
<laughs> you yeah, get your anger is. out, it's- and then sometimes you're just like, I can't get this pot off. Just right. rubber mallet time. So now, as far as the kind of pot, um, as far as size or, mm-hmm. or style, I I use um, they're called azalea style because they're not quite as deep as um your standard pots and um and you can have those in just about any size you can get um i also use pots that are called bulb pants okay because they're Mm -hmm. very shallow and and wider because you have to remember the roots on most begonias are fibrous meaning they're shallow and wide not not long and deep got it And so what happens in most of your deep pots is you have this soil that's not getting used. And so moisture tends to linger there because the roots are not growing down into it readily. And so it can create another conduit for rot, I think. Yeah, no, I agree that, yeah, a lot of times when people are taking uh, begonias out, they're like, wow, uh, was that me? The roots are so shallow, but no, that's just sort of the way they they grow for the most part. So definitely like the Rhizomatus and the Rex begonias. I think, am I wrong that maybe you could push it a little bit with the canes? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you you can. And we do. We have, we use some standard pots, mm-hmm. especially on the 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 more shrub or shrub and thick stem type yeah. because they they tend to grow taller. And so they actually need that weighted heft that a larger, deeper pot can provide to keep them from falling over. Yeah, because some of them can fall over. <laughs> yes. And it's very sad. We had yeah, yeah it really yeah, is. Yeah. I, think- I, I do move specimen ones that are larger, but I I I have learned that I can't move any that are that are actually four feet or taller. You just have to leave them leave as them. is. You yeah. have to move smaller ones mm-hmm. because as soon as you move them, the the, the canes on them just snap yeah. and you hear this pop and it sounds like bones breaking oh. and it just makes you cringe. And I, I'm like, oh, I'm so sad. Yeah. There yeah. was another one. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Um, I hit that. Um, I do want to talk about fertilizer. I know we're throwing mm-hmm. a lot in here. I do want to talk about it because when you came and visited, um, you – you threw out a lot of interesting facts and things that you you uh, you mentioned the what they the pH they like and I was shocked by it and then you even mentioned Super Thrive and I was like whoa I'm intrigued mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, explain what you do what you would do at home what people could do at home and then what your routine is at at the um, Botanic Garden so at home. Um, I like to use a slow release fertilizer because it just makes my life easier. Okay. And and for most people, it's going to be very similar. They they don't want to have to water every single day. They don't want to have to fertilize every time that they water. Mm-hmm. And so I I usually put a watering can on top of my cases that I have the begonias on because I don't want to have to walk and find a watering can. <laughs> because that's also not, not fun for me, but, um, but I, I typically have the slow release. I, I at home steer away from water soluble because people in general are more apt to burn the roots of your begonia with a water soluble than you ever will with a slow release. Okay. Okay. Just because of the nature of how Mm -hmm. the, the, the nutrients are accessible to the plants. Okay. That's a good point. That's a good point. So people are having like burnt edges and they're like, well, the humidity's right. I don't know what's going on. So possibly switch out from water soluble. Mm-hmm. That's good. Okay. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely recommend that. And then, and then if you, if you do really want to use your water soluble, because I, 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 w- I don't advocate throwing those things away because they're, they're a pollutant, mm-hmm. but, um, but you can cut the recommended dosage in half or maybe even quarter it and use that much less okay and and see how the plant responds because a lot of times it's about paying attention to what the plant is doing and being observant yeah. because a lot of people don't do that but we have this wonderful thing now that we didn't have you know 20 
maybe 20 years ago and it's called a smartphone with a camera. (laughs) Yeah. And you can take a picture of it. And each week you take a picture of it about the same time of day. And then over a period of time, you develop this history and then you can see what's happening because we as humans have extremely short-term memory. Mm -hmm. And you know, you don't notice those subtle differences that happen over that length of time. And that helps me immensely because again, I just remember what it, what I thought it looked like a week ago, Yeah, but I would really be hard pressed to tell you what, what it looked like six months ago. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good record keeping because we do our, 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 we're going to remember it's almost like what we choose to remember or, um, but yeah, just having those 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 details. Oh yeah, it it, it did look worse, and now it looks better, or mm, no difference, or anything like that. The phone is my best garden record keeper for me, and I don't even realize it half the time until I go look at pictures, and I'm like, oh, this time last year, these were blooming, or this is what this was going on. So, um, as someone who's a horrible record keeper, <laughs> it's the it makes it super it makes it super easy. Uh-huh. I mean, it's so little that you have to do is you just uh-huh. snap a picture. Yeah, you can set a reminder, and then you've you've got it down, and that's all you have to do. Just remember that there's nothing too important that you can't go do it right then. Yes. Um. So when you say slow release, I'm assuming you mean like Osmocote, or I, I I do like that, but I mean I think it's it's up for you know whatever really works. I don't. Um. I know what I use and what I've got experience with, but uh-huh. I had a colleague that would not use Osmocote because it does have a temperature element to it. Okay. So the warmer your temperatures are, the quicker it can release your nutrients. So uh, we got we would get into I don't want to call it arguments, but we would get into very active discussions <laughs> about about the the pluses and minuses of Osmocote. But um, I I honestly have never had a problem with it across okay. the board. But I, I think that. Don't be afraid to experiment. Mm -hmm. And one of the first rules of keeping um, tropical plants or house plants in general is when you get a new plant and you have it, take a cutting and make a second plant immediately. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Because it never hurts as much as when you lose the only plant that you had. Mm Mm-hmm. Mhm. That's good. Like don't don't be so optimistic. There's a chance you're going to kill this plant. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the other reason that you do that or that we do it and I do it is that when you take a prop uh propagation or a propagule from uh that plant, that new plant is much more apt to adapt mm-hmm. to the living conditions that you put it in just then. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Plants need time to adjust. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, some plants show it like the ficus benjamina will very much show it by dropping all of its leaves, but other plants won't do that. They'll either not grow or their leaves will shrivel up. Um, So, yeah, and definitely like especially, you know, if you're moving them from a humid greenhouse and then you're moving them inside your house and you have the heater running. I mean, that's a huge change in environment and, you know, may never be happy or it may just need a little bit of time to adjust. So, mm-hmm. and, well, you know, and you have to realize that a lot of the the plants that you might get at a, a garden center retailer have come from that greenhouse environment and they've been, they've been shipped. No, I, I couldn't tell you how many thousands of miles if you're, if you're buying from big box um, to the location that you're purchasing from. Yeah. And, and so those conditions are vastly different. Mm -hmm. Now, if you purchase from a local grower and you're, and you see the conditions they're growing in, then you've got a much better way to tell what, what you should and shouldn't be doing. Yeah. No, I mean, that even goes to like this nursery that's down in like, um, in Oakland and Berkeley, um, you know, just from buying plants there, which it's a coastal in you know bay conditions, moving them to the Central Valley, I know they're not going to be happy if I do you know move it from even summertime. So you got to be aware of where how, where your plants are coming from and the adjustment. So that's a good point. Um, so you do the Osmocote at home for the most part, mm-hmm. um, and then at the green at the Botanic Gardens, 
Um, what's the routine there? So at the Botanic Garden, we have fertilizer injectors. Okay. And so they're a, a basically a, a, a gravity type pump mm-hmm. that that pulls water from a reservoir that has the fertilizer in it. But we use a, a recipe, um, and we're using currently. I'm using a fifteen five fifteen water soluble, mm-hmm. and it it's being delivered at roughly around two hundred parts per million. Okay, and so that. That's a really good breakdown. And then that that's also diluted, but we fertilize with that. Um, and that recipe is roughly around um, uh, a full ounce of a product called Basic H, which is almost, I think, kind of like a soap. Okay. It conditions the soil because if you notice in greenhouses, they get this algae growth on the top of the, the soil mm-hmm. and especially in humid environments. And it creates this block that blocks the rest of the soil from absorbing water. And it does that whole thing just like the little puck does. Okay. And yeah. it will prevent the soil underneath from being able to absorb the water. And then you then you have this really nasty vicious cycle. So this this helps to stop that for the most part. And then we also use um uh around a uh, half an ounce of super thrive. And this is in a five gallon uh uh five gallon bucket, and it's five pounds of that fertilizer with those with those two things. So those two you, other things. So when you mentioned super thrive. I didn't laugh because I've heard that from so many expert growers and I I've bought it once in my life to try it. And it's so funny. It's like the one time I buy it, it didn't make it in the, the bag. And so it never made it home. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and, and poor I, thing. <laughs> I know. And I never tried it because it doesn't state what's in it. And I just thought it was like BS. But so many people. It's like it. snake oil. And that's what most people think. But it it really does make a difference. We've seen a difference between begonias watered with it and not watered with it. Wow. So, and you add it to the fertilizer or is this in the five gallon bucket with the basic, um, basic eight? Was that it? Basic H. H. Basic H. Okay. So do you make- so um, we, we add it in with the fertilizer. All of that gets mixed in the, the, bucket and dissolved. Okay. And then that injector pulls that out okay. um uh, as it's watering the the plants for that day. Now we water 3 weeks out of the month mm-hmm. and then the last week we flush with regular tap water. Okay. And I imagine your tap water's pretty good. You've you've had all the measurements ran and Yes. And and what is the pH? Cuz you also said something that I was surprised that you said begonias actually some of them prefer more alkaline conditions, alkaline. which I was mm-hmm. shocked. Um, one, there's so few plants that actually prefer alkaline. And two, I was just thinking mm-hmm. where the begonias are native to. Generally, you think of more of acidic. I mean, even they're not bugs, right. but yeah. So um, what is your pH running? Do you know? at the? It's, it's roughly close to eight. Okay. Like so, a seven, I think a 7.8. Okay. 7.8. Seven a lot of times, but it's on the higher end because in Fort Worth, our uh, we are sitting on a, a very calcitic limestone. Okay, and so all of the surface water and groundwater that we have obviously absorbs that, and it becomes very alkaline. Okay, what do you do for the rest of the plants? I mean, do you guys acidify the soil for? I'm just in, just or do most of the plants do they do okay with that pH? Uh, like begonias or other other types of plants. yeah, your other plants like your orchids and stuff. I imagine that they have to assist. Well, we have um, we have uh, we have four different water types that we have Got access it. to. Okay, now you're just showing off. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have basic tap water, okay. which I use. Yes, okay. we have rainwater oh, catchment nice. system. Okay. Which is typically just above pH neutral. Okay. Uh, for the most part, it might and it might be just below. Um, we also have raw water, which is completely untreated water, and this is part of part of the 
beauty of us being a botanic garden and the fact that we are also the oldest botanic garden in Texas. Mm. Um, we we have had our water system in place since the 50s. Okay. And so we have raw water that gets piped down for the city. And then before it hits the city system, it's diverted off to our pump. Ah, okay. And so it goes to there and it comes to us. And so this is completely untreated water. It also allows us to have much nicer plants because it's lake water and what is in a lake, but lots of nutrition. Oh, that's great. Yeah. It also doesn't smell very good most of the time. (laughs) It's a trade-off. It does smell like lake water. Yeah. It smells pretty fit <laughs> a lot of times when you especially if you come first thing in the mornings because we we do watering in the garden overnight. And so usually overnights, okay. which we don't recommend for the general public. It's mm-hmm. just that we have to since we're a public facing um organization. And so we have to make sure that our guests get the best experience when they are here. Yeah. And so I do like flushing out um watering once a week. And then that's probably only a few times you're watering, I'm guessing. So it's like once a week, you just delegate your, um, to flush out the salts because fertilizers are salt. So that's a good idea. We used to do that flush, use just our deionized water to do that. And mm-hmm. I want to go back to that. Um, so okay. you were, not, we also have access to RO water, I, I do, which is reverse osmosis. Yeah, so. yeah. We would love reverse osmosis. We have deionized water, which is so harsh. So we actually have to put everything back into our fertilizer tanks. Um, mm. so, um, we have to build it from the ground up, but we would love reverse osmosis. Um, I do, before we go, I, I, I do want to talk about just some of the easiest ones for, for a homeowner, say they're not having much luck and we want them to succeed. So we want them to become addicted to begonias. Uh, <laughs> that's how you get them. Um, mm-hmm. and then, you know, also you were mentioning that, uh, the largest ones and some of the smallest ones too, because, Mm -hmm. you know, just talking about the diversity. Um, So what are some easy ones people could grow at home that, you know, they might have just great success with at first? Well, most of your hybrid uh, pain like begonias are just super easy. Mm -hmm. They want to grow. Um, They're going to look usually green angel shaped wheat uh, leaves with either white speckles on them. You've got some newer uh, ones, I think, uh, ice capped is one, mm. uh, you've got, uh, well, I know. uh, avalanche, avalanche is another, oh, yeah, that one's so easy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're just super, oh. super easy. They, they just grow super uh-huh. nice. And then, um, I have, I have one, it's not easy, but it is susceptible to powdery mildew, but it's my favorite. And I have to say it, it's called, um, bat wings. Oh, okay. So it's angel. It's, it's an, an angel wing hybrid. bat wings. <laughs> okay, but it's it's got the the leaf the leaves on it do they're kind of a dark. They have a green tint, but they're dark with a little bit of a pink tint to the spots, and they have these points, and they look just like bat wings. So the name oh. is just completely appropriate, oh. and I love that about it. Fun, I do. I mean, there are some amazing. I mean, people grow them for foliage. Like you came and you saw the black mamba one. I mean, the foliage mm-hmm. is so dark, so dark. So, yes. I mean, it's the foliage is just on begonias is just amazing. Um, so fun. Um, okay. And then when you when you get into the rhizomatous mm-hmm. hybrids, a couple of my favorites are uh, Persian brocade. Okay. Which is super beautiful. It's got this black um this black modeling around the uh leaf margin um and it's got little fine hairs around the leaf margin they they call them eyelash begonias ah, because yeah. one of the species parents has that um it was uh i don't know if it, how far back in the in the hybridization but it's it's a begonia called bower a or bower e b a uh b o w e r a e Okay. Is the name. Okay. And there are a few different forms of that, but the but the larger one, it's they're super pretty. Cool. And then, uh as far as I, I call those the beginner begonias okay. for the most part. No, that's, that's beginner level. Okay. You know, 
you can get through that. And then you get into intermediate and then advanced mm -hmm. and then expert. And expert are typically going to be your terrarium begonias that are that are difficult. Maybe even some of the rexes. Okay. <laughs> even though just because yes. Where are where are some sources people could get? I mean, you know, you have people traveling all over. I mean, you didn't you say you had people who were traveling different countries and you know they they trade and you know but where do yeah we have well we have contacts with uh, a fair amount of collectors that that yeah. do that and have over the years but um there are a few greenhouses that are available they do ship okay. i know that logis yes. and that's yeah. uh uh also uh i believe taylor greenhouses and then you have cartoos and then there are a couple in, if you get a copy of or you look at uh, begonias.org or begonias, yeah, begonias.org, you can look at some of the resources there as well online. Okay. Um, yeah. And, you know, get involved in your local begonia society. I'm sure most cities have, have them. I know the Sacramento one, I think, just celebrated, I forget how many years. It's, it's 75. 75. Yeah. It's, it's an older one, but most, most cities will have, and, and they're, I mean, that's a wealth. They usually do swaps and we didn't even talk about propagation. I was going to say, there's <laughs> nothing better in the world than finding some, uh, another begonia uh -huh. lover that, uh, that is willing to trade you begonias for free. Yes. And yeah, we didn't even get it. We'll have to have you back and talk about propagation because it's a whole different game. But the nice thing about begonias is where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> So Absolutely. And I think begonias are super easy. They want to grow. Yes. So they are they're not hard to propagate yes. at all. And I'm sure you have some great, great tips. But yeah, those are great greenhouses um, for various ones. Your local begonia society and begonias.org, I'm sure, has resources on there. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just and of course, you know, your local nurseries as well. But you know, until you get some under your feet, uh, you know, you could fall for the gorgeous ones at the grocery store, but just, you know, don't. <laughs> Those may not be the first one. Just know can. that when you kill it out of love, uh -huh. you can always go get another one exactly. and do the same again. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so, you, you you know, when I asked you, I said, oh, well, you know, you want to tell me anything aside? And you're like, yeah, I want to tell you about the largest and the smallest. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that would be fun because I'm sure you're going to wow me. I mean, you already wowed okay. me with the 15 tall one. But yeah, you think, of, you know, most people think of these begonias as getting, you know, maybe, you know, the cane begonia, sure, they're taller. But so what's the smallest begonia? The smallest begonia is a begonia called Venker hovinii. Oh, Venker. It is roughly um, the plant that I have um, is roughly the diameter around the entire the entire root ball is probably no bigger than a 50 cent piece. Oh, oh, that's so cute. And where is it native Tiny. to? It is native to Africa. It has a beautiful, and this is where I get to talk about the flowers. Uh-huh. It's a beautiful yellow flower. Oh, okay. So yellow is rare. It's mm -hmm. uncommon. Mm -hmm. uh, but um we believe that begonias uh, originally evolved in Africa, in tropical Africa. Oh, interesting. And so at one point, all the begonias in the world were there. Well, when the continents were together, they spread out. And so, um, and they went all around the tropical and subtropical regions around, around the world. Well, um, all no, I, I don't want to say all. I'm sorry. A vast majority of the African begonias are yellow in bloom. Interesting. So, However, uh -huh. in the rest of the world, you get whites, pinks, and reds. Yeah. And that's about it. So it's obviously except to do with for, pollination. Except, hmm? I mean, it's obviously they they the poll pollinators of some sort kept that going i mean that's oh yeah absolutely with, yeah so, absolutely there's there's something. something but begonias are pollinated by deception that's yeah. a whole nother topic well i would just say like we we test students they have to do this pollination thing and it's their stigmas look like pollen so for i mean that's basically is that it in a nutshell yes they, that's it in a nutshell yeah yeah that they 
the poor pollinators get tricked. <laughs> yeah, they so, sure do. Yes. Uh, so that one's tiny and you have that. Yes, yes, it's gorgeous. It's super pretty. Um, it's just got these tiny itty bitty the leaves on it. God, I I I am hard pressed to find something that's equitable. But oh. I think if you imagine your earbuds, your AirPods uh-huh. for your yeah. ears, think of that earpiece that fits in. Yeah. Your the leaves on it are probably no bigger than that. Oh my gosh, how cute! And it just, yeah, it's and it, super tiny. It's super tiny. And where, where in, I mean, it's tropical in, in the African region or is it more on the dry side? No, it's in the, it's in the, uh, tropical okay. region, I believe. All right. Wow. That's so cute. Okay. Now go to the largest. So, um, largest would be, there's a few, there's Colosa, which okay. has this mm-hmm. fluting on the, on the stem. That's super interesting. Um, that can get upwards of 15 feet or at least at least 12 to 15 okay. feet if given the support that okay. it needs um you have one called Jocelynoi you have platanifolia Platanifolia. you have uh uh reniformis formis okay so all of these are all tall shrub like or excuse me thick stem begonias mm-hmm. sorry okay and and they all develop these thick really thick stems but super interesting and tall and they get these just giant inflorescences that oh. that are just beautiful to look at tiny little flowers but so many of them that it's it's really a wow mm. and and are these more i picture those being more almost like in a cloud forest or um, i think that the most of your um, your thick stemmed are going to be lower down yeah. in the, in Dry. the forest itself, not yeah. up high. That's there true. are a few that are, yeah. there's one called, uh, parvifolia, okay. I believe that is, it's a, a high altitude, uh, uh, I believe in the Andes. Mm. So that would be South America, Peru, yeah. Re- Peruvian cloud forest. And that one's tall. I okay. saw one in atlanta at the atlanta botanical garden that had that was i think probably around eight feet tall and how quickly would they grow to that size i mean are they slow growing Um, or would that reach that height no most of your begonias are pretty pretty quick Mm -hmm. they grow pretty quickly and and they're heavy feeders they like they're like vegetables you know they they want a lot of food because they um in a lot of the indigenous cultures where we find these, um, they're a food or a medicinal product. Yeah, I have people sample the um, the flower buds on them for the o- oxalic acid, correct? Yes. That yeah. nice tang. Um, I didn't know it was a food source. Um, they, they usually cook it. I, I know that um, one of our um, national ABS members went on a trip um, I don't remember if it was in the Philippines or in, in Malaysia, mm-hmm. uh, but he had talked about how one, one of the times that he was served, um, uh, like either boiled or fried, uh, bl- blossoms wow. for begonias. And yeah. I thought, wow, those must've been really big because a lot of them are really tiny. Yeah, tiny. Well, I guess fried if they're battered and that probably breaks. I mean, I would imagine if they're fried or cooked, you're going to break down that oxalic acid. So you're not going to have that tang. I don't know. Right. So it's more of like just a, a green vegetable that's your fried. I'm guessing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How interesting. Yeah. But um, yeah, I always have people sample them, you know, because they're used to the 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 weedy oxalis like that. Um, well, this has been exciting. I mean, we could, I mean, I know I could pick your brain forever about begonias. Like I said, we didn't even talk about propagation. We didn't even, I mean, there's so many, so many places you could go with begonias. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I just have to say that I pinch myself every day and I don't want to lose that that little kid excitement uh-huh. I get when I walk into the greenhouse and I see something different that I didn't see the day before. And I'm, and I, how, and I think, how did I miss that? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's the great thing is 
well, well, especially with that many species. I mean, that's that's how I feel about going into the conservatory. When people are like, well, when's a good time to visit? I'm like, every day. <laughs> you know, every there's, day. There's yeah. something new and different. And um, yeah, and you always see new things. And it's also the challenge, you know, of 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 trying to grow these plants in cultivation. It is a challenge. Mm-hmm. Um, it, yeah, it definitely is. One of the things that that was that was told to me when we did uh, I, I call it an industry tour when we had another botanic gardens um, staff come visit us mm-hmm. and they saw the collection for the first time because most of your plant collections are not a single plant genus in its own house. Yes. It's always a mixture exactly. of all of these different plants, usually geographically or regionally mm-hmm. based on environmental conditions. And then you've got, they're all together to make it easier to grow them. Yeah. Well, the begonias are housed in their own houses. There are no other plants in there. It's only begonias. That's amazing. But these begonias are from all around the world. And that's the challenge is you have to, you have to find a happy medium or I have to find a happy medium all the time. It's a, it's again, a moving target. Yeah. No, I mean, cause within that greenhouse, there's microclimates. There's, you yes. know, it's, it's every, every yard, every house and every greenhouse has its own microclimate. So, you, you know, you know, the dry spots, you know, the lower humidity, you know, the cooler spots. So, and that has changed throughout the year too. So, but yeah, I mean, they sure do. Um, you know, that's what makes it fun is, you know, you're, you're, I, I'm, you're always learning, even though you're an expert, you're always learning and, and, you know, people are discovering hopefully new begonias and hybridizing. My gosh, there's so many, so many out there. It's, it's mind boggling. Yes. You can't keep up with them. No, it's just crazy. No. So where can people, you mentioned begonias.org, um, Fort Worth Botanic Gardens, I know has their Instagram. Um, so throughout some, um, places people could see maybe some pictures of Fort Worth collection. Um, so if anybody wants to watch a video, we have had um, uh, a probably well-known YouTuber. Her name is Summer Rain Oaks, mm-hmm. and it's R-A-Y-N-E-O-A-K-E-S. Um, she has um, come to the collection twice now, uh, five years apart. Okay. And she has got several... Uh, I think several episodes that's dedicated to just begonias. Nice. And I think that's a great visual way to see what we do, especially the newer, the, the one that she came in and, and toured this year. Okay. Nice. They, you can also look us up on Facebook. We have a local branch, the DFW May Blanton, M A E B L A N T O N branch of the American Begonia Society. We we do post there as well, and and also on the that the branches Instagram. Okay, and I'll put all these show notes down, um, the links in the show notes and stuff. So, um, but yeah, so that's some good good reference points to see because you know well, I want to see some of these pictures of these begonias. <laughs> So, um, and then another another really, I think it's a an excellent resource mm-hmm. is the International Begonia Database. Oh, okay. Just Google it, and okay. it's not a terribly sophisticated website. Okay. It's managed by uh, the database is managed by a uh, hybridizer. His name is Ross Balwell, and he hybridized a begonia that's one of our favorites called Challenger. It is one of the largest hybrid uh, rhizomatous begonias out there. Oh. It's just ginormous. Okay, I'm going to have to look that up. Okay, so there's if you, I'm I'm not I'm not a tall guy. I am five foot six, mm-hmm. so you can imagine my my I'll call it my wingspan. Even though it's more, it's not a wingspan. I'm not I'm not a big basketball <laughs> player, but. Um, it is wider across the entire plant than I can reach. No. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it's not not the single leaf, but uh-huh. the whole grouping yeah. of the and the rhizomes are just huge. Oh they are my gosh. Enormous. Do you guys have that in the collection? We do. Oh, wow. We keep it in the collection and it is an out of place. We typically have all of our collection organized alphabetically. Uh-huh. Um, by type of begonia 
And this begonia has a particular spot. And since it's so charismatic, we leave it there. We don't uh, move it. Yeah. Don't mess with it. It's happy there. <laughs> yeah. 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 When yeah. you plant when your plant finds a sweet spot, you're like, oh, do I move it? No. Uh oh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, those are great resources. And this has been a lot of fun. I've learned a lot. Um, you know. And uh, I'm sure everyone else has learned a lot and people do love begonias. And the nice thing about begonias is it's definitely bridging the gap between old gardeners and young gardeners. And, you know, they're pretty hip and cool. And and even if it's a gateway plant to get people into growing other plants. But I think once people start growing begonias, they're always going to grow begonias. I think it I, is. I do. I do tell people that in the garden itself, all of our hybrids are our gateway drug yes. to conservation. Yeah. Because that's how you introduce people to mm-hmm. what's really most important to us. Yeah. And as someone who is way into flowers, you know, begonias have beautiful flowers, they're, but they're known for their foliage more. So to me, it's like it's the best of, you know, both worlds. So um, thanks for joining me and everyone else. Hopefully you learned from this. And until next time, happy gardening.